Father, we thank you again for thy holy word. As we approach your word today, we approach it reverently and humbly. We pray for each person in attendance that each ear shall be listening, that each mind shall be open, and that each heart shall be receptive to thy holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to the same scriptures that we looked at in our Bible class yesterday afternoon. That's Hebrews chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, and Ephesians chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, and Ephesians chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, began to read with verse 1. God, who at sundry times in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Then turning to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things are beings in earth, and things are beings under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then in Ephesians, the first chapter, be well for us to begin to read again with the 17th verse to get the full import of what he's saying. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Here's the foundation of the whole thing. And we want to get, build a good foundation to operate off of. We said to you, that some men are born to a great name, like a king, for instance. But uh, others make their name great by their achievements. And then others have a great name conferred upon them. Jesus' name is great. Because first, he inherited a great name. We read here where it said that he inherited a more excellent name. And then secondly, his name is great because of his achievements. And then third, his name is great because it was conferred upon him. He inherited a greater name than any of the angelic beings. Hebrews here tells us. And as a son, he is heir of all things. Now he is, this scripture in Hebrews said, the express image of God. 
the brightness, the outshining, one translation reads, of the Father. This portion of Scripture in Hebrews said that He is God speaking to us. God who at sundry times in divers manners spake unto the, our forefathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. His name comes to Him as an inheritance. It said He hath inherited a more excellent name than they, talking about the angels. Then here in Philippians, the second chapter, the ninth, tenth, and eleventh verses, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now you know if these truths could ever just get filtered through to our hearts, but it's almost beyond our capacity to grasp it. But as we feed upon it, little by little, it'll become a part of our inner consciousness. And once it does, it'll be said of us as it was in the Old Testament, there are giants in the land. Amen. For this will make us and cause us to become spiritual giants. Which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things or beings in heaven and beings in the earth and beings under the earth. That means men, angels, and devils or demons must bow to that name. Now what does that mean? That means must submit, must give in must respect, must honor, because that name's above every name. Amen. Amen. When we can catch a glimpse in our spirits, not in our heads, and yet we have to teach it and have to go through our heads to get down into our hearts. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You see, believings of the heart, where the heart man believeth, but the word goes through your head to get into your heart. Because you see, your mind is the door to your heart. And so once these truths ever uh, really dawn on our hearts, we will, as I said, become spiritual giants. We catch a glimpse occasionally, some of us have, and when we have... We've done exploits. But by continuing to feed along this line and to live in this place, I believe we can get to the place where we just won't be there occasionally, bless God, but we'll just live there. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Of things in heaven, or beings in heaven, beings in the earth, and beings under the earth. That means heaven, earth, and hell. Recognize what Jesus did. And all that Jesus did is all the authority and all the power, all of his achievements is in his name. And the name on our lips will work the same thing now as it did then. Amen. Now what I'm about to say will not work just because you do it from a head knowledge standpoint or just because you try it. But I remember I was in the last few days of August about the read really the last week of August and the first week of September of 1952. I was over meeting down these texts, and I was lying across my bed in the afternoon with my Bible and another book, doing some studying, not necessarily just studying for the service that night, but just feeding upon God's Word for my own spiritual edification and benefit. 
And this was one of the scriptures that I was looking at here in Philippians 2 about the name of Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow of beings in heaven and in earth and under the earth. And uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I caught a glimpse momentarily of something. I, uh, I mean in my spirit. I don't mean in my natural mind. I caught a glimpse just momentarily of the name of Jesus and the authority of that name, what that name would do. And, and, and particularly about in the earth. You know, that's where we're living right here. Amen. That name will work in heaven, it'll work here on the earth, and it'll work under the earth. All three worlds, and those three worlds we have to do with. Demons, humans, in this earth, and over into the spirit world. Praise God in heaven. That name has authority. Like Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. And so I can remember with that revelation, with that, with that uh, in my spirit, with that just, just, just a glimpse, I just rose up because I knew that name worked. said, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I break the power of the devil over my brother, my oldest brother's life, and claim his deliverance, that is, his deliverance from Satan, and claim his salvation. And to me, that settled it. And you know, within 10 days, he's born again. And I'd prayed and fasted for him off and on for 15 years. Never seemed to do any good. But the minute I rose up with the name of Jesus. But you see, that won't work until you get the revelation of it. And you won't get the revelation of it without studying. I was there studying you see, feeding on God's Word. And so that's one reason that we're teaching along this line. And you may not really get the revelation of what we're saying just now. But if you'll continue to feed and continue to study, sooner or later, now if you throw it away and give it up, it won't ever happen to you. But sooner or later, what we're saying, what the Word of God is saying, will dawn on your heart, on your spirit, down here on the inside of you. Hallelujah. That's a good place just to stop there in that 10th verse and sort of dwell there for a little bit. Sort of have a camp meeting there. <laughs> that at the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee really must bow. Praise God. The beings in heaven and in earth and under the earth. I just don't think the full import of that's ever dawned on us yet. We just haven't grasped the significance of it. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you see, if it tells us in Hebrews, that he inherited a greater name than the angels. Here it declares that God gave unto him the name which is above every name. It infers that there was a name known in heaven. And this name was kept to be conferred upon someone who should merit it. And Jesus, as we know him, the eternal son, was given that name. Praise God. And that this name, this name, every knee shall bow. Three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell. And every tongue confess that he is the Lord of the three worlds to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. Well, it is this, our Lord Jesus Christ, this man, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us the right to use his name. Now again, I don't think that's ever dawned on us. I don't think that's ever, that truth's ever registered upon our spirit consciousness. 
I don't think the church knows anything at all about it. I'm not talking about the church. I mean the church world as a whole. We use the name a lot of time, but just like we do any other name. We don't realize the significance of it. We don't realize the authority of it. But he gave us the right to use his name. And here in Ephesians, this first chapter, and we started reading there a moment ago with the 17th verse, we find a prayer by Paul, and it is a most unusual prayer. I read it to you in the King James translation. Let's just sum it up in, uh, a little bit in a little different language, but say the same thing. He prays, Paul prays for the church at Ephesus, but now he's not only praying for the church at Ephesus, because this is a spirit-given prayer, it, it belongs to believers everywhere. Christians everywhere, right here in Tulsa or wherever you are from or wherever you live. And so he prays that the Father God will open the eyes of our understanding. That really means the eyes of our spirit. Another translation reads that way, that the eyes of your spirit may be enlightened. You see, that's where you got to get the knowledge of God's words in your spirit, your heart down on the inside of you. You'll never be able to get it up with your mentality because your mentality is not great enough to grasp what he's saying. But he said, the eyes of your understanding are the eyes of your spirit, another translation said, being enlightened that we may know something of the riches of the, of the Father's inheritance in us. Then that our eyes may be opened, that we may see what is the exceeding greatness of his power on our behalf who believe. He declares that it is according to the working of the strength of God's might, which was wrought in the dead body of Jesus when he raised him from among the dead. And when he raised him and made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenness, far above all rule and authority, and power, and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this world or this age, but in that which is to come. And he gave him to be head over all things for the benefit of the church. Hallelujah. For the benefit of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all things in all. That's what he's saying. It's a little different wording, but that's the essence of what he's saying there. Now, he not only inherited a more excellent name than any other being in the universe, God not only gave him a name before which every being in the three worlds shall bow and confess his lordship, but here God has given him a name which is above every name, and he has seated him in the highest place in the universe at his own right hand and made him head over all things. Now, for what purpose? For what purpose? God made this investment for the benefit of the church. And notice he said head over all things to the church or for the benefit of the church. He made him or he made this investment for us. God did. He has made this deposit on which the church has a right to draw for her every need. He has given to him the name that has within it the fullness of the Godhead, the wealth of the eternities, and the love of the heart of the Father God, and that name is given to us. Hallelujah. We have the right to use that name against our enemies. We have the right to use that name in our petitions and our prayers. We have a right to use that name in our praises and in our worship. That name has been given unto us. Belongs to us. But you know, that's only the beginning 
of the wonders and the value of the greatness of that name. Colossians, the second chapter and the 15th verse. We get a deeper view of his conquest. Remember that his name was conferred upon him because of his conquest. And we get a deeper view of his conquest of the satanic forces just before he arose from the dead. Because it said here in Colossians 2.15 that he spoiled principalities and powers, making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now another translation said, having despoiled the principalities and the powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now here is a picture of Christ in the dark regions of the lost, in awful combat with the host of darkness. Because you see, you're right there in Colossians 2.15, you could look there in Colossians, the first chapter. And you could see in the 12th and 13th verses what he did for us. And that he has delivered us from the authority, the power, or the authority of darkness. This scripture here in Colossians 2.15 gives us a glimpse of the tremendous victory that Jesus won before he arose from the dead. Another translation reads, having put off from himself the principalities and powers, he arose the mighty victor. He arose the mighty victor. You see, the sin problem was settled and man's redemption was a fact. It's accomplished. Praise God. Remember on the cross he cried and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, he became what we were, spiritually dead. That is, separated from God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And his spirit, not just his body only, but his spirit paid the penalty for sin. Because sin isn't just a physical thing. You couldn't pay for the, the penalty for sin by just a physical thing. Otherwise, it would just be physical. It's spiritual. If you study carefully the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, even in, in the King James translation, I hold the King James translation here, and uh, the word there speaks in the translation about his death, but there's a little letter by the word death, and I looked over in the margin, and it says deaths. Deaths, plural. See, he died both physically and spiritually. And in his deaths, the Hebrew Bible says, the, 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 the Holy Bible, the original scripture says, in his deaths, plural. You seek that out, it'll, it'll bless you. But you see... Jesus arose. Now that's described in Hebrews, the second chapter in the 14th verse. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death. Now again, death here isn't talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual death. He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. I think Rotherham's translation will give you a clear picture of Hebrews 2.14. In order that through death he might paralyze him that held the dominion of death, that is the devil. Now when you read that, do not think of physical death. If you do, you'll never get what he's saying. It'll never dawn on your heart, your spirit. But when you read that word death, think of spiritual death. Because see, that is where Satan dominates. Now let's read it with that thought in mind. In order that through death he might paralyze him that held the dominion of death. 
That is the devil. Did you get it? In other words, after Jesus had put off from himself, and another translation reads there back in Colossians 2.15 where it said that he uh, put to naught, one translation said he spoiled, one translation said he put to naught, another translation he said he stripped himself off these principalities and powers. So he put off from himself the awful burden of guilt and sin and sickness that he carried because see, he took our place, so he had all of that. He grappled with Satan and conquered him and left him paralyzed and whipped and defeated. Amen. Amen. The Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the words that Jesus spoke in Luke 11, chapter 21st and 22nd verses are fulfilled. Now, I want to read King James translation first, and then I'll read another translation of Luke 11, 21, 22. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger, then he shall come upon him and overcome him. He taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoil. Another translation said, When a strong man, fully armed, guardeth his own court, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him his whole armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. So when Christ rose from the dead, he not only had the keys of death and of hell, but he had the very armor in which Satan trusted. Hallelujah. He has defeated the devil. And he stands before the three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell as the undisputed victor over man's ancient destroyer, Satan. Hallelujah. Now is it any wonder, get the picture now, is it any wonder that fresh from such tremendous victories that he should say to the disciples, all power, and that Greek word means authority, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. He stands as the master and as the ruler of the universe. All power, all authority is given unto me or has been given unto me, either way you want to say it. His name now is above every name. And at his name we can understand how every knee shall bow and all of this authority and power that Jesus gained by his mighty conquest is in that name and he's given that name to us. The authority that he is one has one, is delegated to us in the use of that name. Because he said, go ye therefore. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore. He delegated that authority to us. And in my name, go ye therefore to all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, in my name, in my name, demons will have to obey you. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and shall recover. In my name, in my name, they'll do it. No, that don't mean that you just handle snakes and try to prove something. Like a preacher friend of mine down in East Texas. 
like four or five sinner men. I talked to one of the, one of the men. Well, he wasn't a sinner. He's talking to me. He's a Christian. They got saved as a result of it. This man's pastor of a country church, a little full gospel church. These men had gone fishing. And uh, they were way back in the woods or thicket. Couldn't possibly get to any help. And this pastor of this full gospel church, assembly God pastor, actually was bitten by. Well, everybody knew he's going to be dead. They couldn't possibly. In fact, this, this man told me, he said we were just, just, well, the way he put it, scared to death. We knew, you know, we couldn't possibly get him in there, get him back in to help. But he said he just shook that off and said, don't bother about me in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. It's very common. Went on about his business. And that man told me personally, he said, I was a sinner, boy. And man, he said, I got saved as a result of it. I saw, <laughs> you know, we ought to be able to see God in operation. <laughs> Amen. See God in operation. God's a spirit. You can't see him with a physical eye. But I'll tell you, bless God, you can see him in operation. Amen. And so, he told me personally, he said, I watched him. Pastor didn't tell me. This is one of his men telling me. He said, I watched him. He said, in fact, there's three of us. There's that were sinners, there's several more men in the group, and said, we watched him. But said, never did affect him in any way, shape, form, fashion. Never did affect him. Never had any effect upon the man whatsoever. Amen. Now, you see, he realized the authority of that name. He realized the authority of that name. In my name. In my name. I, uh, because, you see, Pentecostal people believe in the supernatural. I heard the Brother F.D. Davis, who at that time was superintendent of the Texas District of Assemblies of God, tell about years ago, they had a convention, a district convention in Corpus Christi, Texas. They began to check in there. They put up a tent for their meetings. In fact, they stayed in a hotel there all right, but they... They ate out there on the grounds and so on, back early days, many, many years ago. And uh, people began getting sick. They came over to the tent to pray. And God showed them. This hotel wasn't just, well, it was many years ago, and they didn't have all the plumbing I got now. You know, they just had a pitcher of water in each room. And a wash pan there for you to wash your hands, you see. And so... Uh, People come in and drunk that water and got sick to stomach. Well, they went out to the tent to pray. And God, through revelation of the word of knowledge, revealed to them that the water was poisoned. Well, they told the rest of them not to drink anymore, and all that had, why, well, in the name of Jesus, they claimed this problem in the name, the name, the name. That name should bring results. Nobody died. Those that were sick got healed. Well, he's a naval station, and they still is there in Corpus Christi. And they took this water out there and have it analyzed, and the government men there said that there was enough water, enough poison in the water that was in those pitchers to kill a regiment of men. And not a one of them died because of the name. Now, they didn't just drink something to try to prove something. They accidentally, they didn't know it was there. Spirit of God told them, as soon as he told them, well, then they quit. They didn't drink any more of it. Now, somebody, some devil-inspired individual said, well, now, you know, these people are supposed to be the supernatural. We'll, we'll just, we'll put them to the We'll see how much supernatural they believe in. But they found out, didn't they? The name of Jesus should work today just as much as it ever did. The name of Jesus belongs to us. I don't think we've ever realized the inheritance that we have in that name. Now, all that he was, all that Jesus was, and that's the reason I wanted to go into detail and tell about what he did and what he was, is in that name. All he is today is in that name. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 8 said the same, yesterday, today, and forever. All that he was is in that name. All he is today is in that name. And that name is ours. Hallelujah. 
Jesus was given that name that he might give it to us. He gave his name to us that we might carry out the will of God the Father upon the earth in this dispensation that we're living in. Now we know this, that the early church utilized that authority. The early church used that name. We'll go in detail about it later on. But there in the Acts of the Apostles, the man at the gate called Beautiful. People ran together there, you know, after that crippled man, you know, was healed and went into the temple leaping, walking, praising God. And the crowd gathered together and Peter said, why look on us? As though by our own power, our own holiness, we'd made this man to walk. He said, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Faith in the name of Jesus. Yea, the faith which is by him has given this man perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Well, did the name of Jesus work one way then? Now it don't work. Did the name of Jesus just belong to the early church? It don't belong to us? See, I think we've acted like that. No, thank God that name belongs to us. We are the church. I've said it before, say it again. They didn't have one church then. We've got another church now. We are members of the same body. They are members of the same body of Christ. Glory to God. And so the early church utilized this authority. The early church acted for Jesus in his stead. They wrought miracles, and the miracles opened doors for ministry and for service. It gave authority to their credentials. Now some folks said, well, now they needed that authority, but we don't. Who said so? Now then, you know, we got to church. Now they had that authority, all right. And uh, they got the church established, but now we don't need that authority today. You mean we don't need the name of Jesus today? Because you see, that's where the authority was. It was in the name. And to say that we don't need that authority today is tantamount to saying we don't need the name of Jesus today. Well, if that's the case, then we've got no way of getting our prayers answered. Then we can't come to the Father in the name of Jesus. Then if we don't have the name and we don't need the name of Jesus today, then we can't even get in the church. For there is salvation by no other name except the name of Jesus. So if we don't need the authority that they had, and if we don't have the authority they had, then we don't have the salvation they had. We don't have the new birth they had. Because you see, it's all wrapped up in the name. They didn't have some special authority apart from the name. Remember later on there in the Acts of the Apostles? Those seven sons of Siva, you know, they saw Paul casting out devils, you know. And so they said, well, we'll, we'll try that, you see. So... So they went to the fellow that's demon-possessed, you know, and said, We adjure thee in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Come out of it. <laughs> and that devil in that fellow spoke up and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> See, they had no right to use that name. They weren't believers. Are you following me? They weren't Christians. That name didn't belong to them. And that fellow jumped on them. The devil, you know, was in him, and he jumped on them, you know, and uh, seven of them tore their clothes off of them, and they ran out naked, you know, <laughs> overcame. Bible don't say so, but I just imagine they didn't try that anymore. <laughs> don't you? But now listen, that name does belong to the church. That name does belong to us. Praise God. And we can use that name. Now, where was the authority then? It was in the name, wasn't it? That's where the authority was. In the name of Jesus. Now then, we have a right to use that name today just as much as they did. Because that name belongs to us. I think it'd be well if we looked here at John, the 14th chapter, the 13th and 14th verses. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 16th chapter then, 23rd and 24th verses. Now, understand that there's a difference between 14th chapter John, the 16th chapter John. 14th chapter John, 13th verse. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now down here in John 16, 24, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, ask ye shall receive that your joy may be full. You see, John 16, 23, and 24 is talking about prayer, but 
John 14, 13 is not talking about prayer. Now you need to get that picture clear. Now many times people appropriate that, but that isn't so. You see, whatever you ask, and look up the Greek word ask in the concordance, it means demand. He said, whatever you demand in my name, I'll do it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And to gate called beautiful, you see, John, uh, Peter just took that man by the hand and demanded in the name of Jesus that he get up. He didn't pray for him. The man got up. He demanded or asked in the name of Jesus, you see, that he arise and that he, and he did. He was healed. But now here in John, he said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, John 16, 23 and 24. You see here in, in John 14, 13, you don't ask the Father anything. Whatever you shall ask, whatever you demand is a better translation. In my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. But when it comes to prayer, whatever you ask the Father, in my name, He will give it to you. See the difference between the two? Now you need to see that. You see, John 14, 13 is a striking promise when we realize that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. That Jesus holds the highest position in the universe as the head of the church. And he says, whatsoever ye shall ask or demand in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Hallelujah. And then here is that charter promise, as I said, John 16, 23 and 24, where he was talking about praying the Father. Hitherto, up till now, you've never prayed in my name. But now, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give it you. Hallelujah. Now, this promise, you see, is, is an important statement. And it, it's a true statement. That we have the use of the name of Jesus in our prayer life. And that that name guarantees an answer. Now I want you to see something that's very important here. Did you ever notice, and, and John's the only one that records these statements that Jesus made relative to prayer. And he made these statements just before he went away. Because a new day's coming. See, in that day he shall ask me nothing. 23rd verse. In that day he shall ask me nothing. But whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, ask you shall receive that your joy may be full. Again, if you demand anything in my name, not talking about demand of the Father, demand of the devil, I'll do it. Again, John 15, 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now, did you ever notice John in his gospel never one single time mentions faith in connection with prayer? Did you notice that? Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. They're quoting what he said to the Jews, however. We quote them because there's some principles involved with us. Then when you get to the Acts and then you go on over into the epistles written to the church, Paul wrote half of them. Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude. Not one single time does anybody ever write to the church ever encourage them or tell them to believe or to have faith. Did you ever notice that? Now why? Because that's who they are. They are believers. Our having to encourage people to believe and to have faith is a result of the Word of God having lost its reality in our lives. Now notice this. John, again, get this now. John, again, the 16th chapter, we were looking at it, look at it again. In that day you shall ask me nothing, but whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, Ask, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Now notice, he does not say, whatsoever you ask the Father, and if you believe, he'll give it to you. He didn't say that. Or, if you have faith. Now why didn't he? Or oh, if this truth ever dawns on you. See, why didn't he? 
Why is faith not mentioned? Why is believing not mentioned here? Only the name of Jesus. Well, you see, this name has been given to us. It's ours. It's ours. What is mine, I do not need faith to use it. See, we're about to be dismissed here. You have a car out here somewhere? I do. You have some car keys? What would you think about the time we got ready to be dismissed here? That if the president of the student body here would hold up his hands. Brother Hagin, just before you go, hold up his key. He said, I want all y'all to pray that I'll have faith to go out and put this key in my car and unlock the door. <laughs> well, we'd think something got loose up there somewhere. <laughs> you know? <laughs> all right. That name has been given to us. It's ours. What's mine, I do not need faith to use. When we are born into the family of God, the right to use the name and the privileges to use it come with the new birth. All the authority vested in that name is given to us to bring glory to the name of the Father, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Hallelujah. That's what he says. That name belongs to us. That name, invested in that name, is all the power and all the authority that Jesus had and exercised and is. In other words, Jesus, in his name, is right there with us to do the job. Remember the verse that we quoted, Matthew 18, 19, 20 verses? Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now, don't stop reading. That's not all he said. For. For is a conjunction. It joins what he's about to say to what he just said. For, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I. His name being present is the equivalent of him being present. See it? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I. His name will do all that he himself would do if he was here. His name will do it. His name will do it. And so... He has given us that name. It belongs to us. It belongs to the church. The weakest child of God. Oh, I'm so weak and unworthy. Well, the weakest child of God, the most seemingly unworthy. Child of God has a legal right to all the grace and all the might and all the power and all the blessing and all the health and all the healing and all the life that's enwrapped in the person who bore that name, and that was Jesus his name is Jesus. And his name belongs to us. All that Jesus was, all that Jesus was, that name will ever be during this dispensation. Has that name lost any of its power? No. Hallelujah. 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 Let's just lift our hands and praise God for the name of Jesus. Praise God for the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for, it, Thank you for the name. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. That concludes this message. For more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. 
And in Canada, write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Ontario, Canada, M9A4X3.